Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and of course it's the fabulous Christopher. Chris, have we got on today? Well, tonight we thought we'd go some, something slightly different. Uh, we have former Royal Marine, former policeman, lifelong drummer, Brian Short, who's here today to talk to us about his time in the, uh, I hate to say this as, as history because this happened during my lifetime, but it's the uh, 40th anniversary of the Falklands War. So he's come today to talk to us about his experiences in that war. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Thanks very much for the invitation to come and uh, talk with you. Brian, explain this whole lifelong drummer thing. I mean, we touched on it, obviously, off uh, off the recording, but t- tell us, explain a little bit more about this. Well, I think um, no matter what I've done in my life, playing drums has been important. So no matter what uniform or costume or life or marriage I've been in, playing the drums has always been the one strand that's brought it all together. And I still play now. I still play music now. So it's uh, they'll be with me to my death. So I, I guess when they take me in a coffin, you'll hear the rat tat tat of me inside still practicing. So it's that for me, it's been the, a constant throughout my life. I like that. That's really interesting. OK, yeah. so you obviously you, we know you, you were in the, in the military. So tell us a little bit about your life and your family background before you you jumped the gun and and I don't know, I don't know how to say this, and jumped for you first into the military. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that'll do. Um, well, unfortunately for me, um, uh, war was visited upon my family even before I was born because uh, my father served in the Royal Marines, but he was killed two months before I was born. He was killed at Suez in 1956, and I was born in January of 57. So I never knew him. But what I did get from him was his name. I had the same name as him and a leaning towards the Royal Marines. And then, as we've, as I've said before, playing the drums, when I eventually joined the Royal Marines, already playing a bit of drums, uh, the careers officer must have had a quota to fill and he channeled me into the band instead of the commandos, the fighting unit, which obviously in the end turned out to be a very good decision for me and gave me a lifelong career in music. But the strange thing about um, having my father killed is that there is a Royal Marine headstone in Gosport in Portsmouth with the name Brian John Short on it, my name. Uh, and so it's quite uh, quite spooky seeing your own name on a headstone, albeit your father's. Um, miserable childhood, to be honest. I had a stepfather. It was a miserable childhood. I can't remember much anything good about it. And uh, so it's the first opportunity, which was 15 and a half, that's when I applied to join the Royal Marines and then went to the um, Royal Marines School of Music down in Deal in Kent, where I live now, and started my training. Now, early training for, for, for musicians was some basic training, some basic weapon training, some learning how to march, and then the, the next two years uh, practicing music at the Royal Marines School, School of Music every day, marching to work across to another barracks and playing drums. So my early life uh, was quite sad and miserable. The middling and the teen, teen years was uh, was quite good. Not this isn't related to the podcast, but you're not far away from me. Um, I'm in Gillingham, so I'm not that far from, from Deal. Well, a couple of hours, but... Oh, Gillingham, I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Everyone is. Can I just say a couple of hours, Chris, being around the corner is like 20 minutes. Well, it, yeah, no, it's, it's, it would be an hour. Crying. I took my uh, daughter um, skating there once, so it's exactly an hour from from door to falling on your bum in Gillingham. Yeah. <laughs> I could easily get sidetracked to discuss this, but <laughs> but so you, you got away from home and you're in the military. How was how was your early career? Was, was it an improvement on what had happened before? Yeah, my early career, my, my first ever posting after I finished my, my, my military and musical training was to an aircraft carrier called HMS Ark Royal. And I was 19 years old. And I joined the ship in Plymouth, which incidentally was my hometown. And in January of that year, we sailed to America during their bicentennial year. 
So for six months during their bicentennial, uh, we were the only Marines on board uh, an aircraft carrier, going ashore, playing gigs, playing for dignitaries, and you just couldn't do a thing wrong. They even had a dial a, a marine service or dial a sailor service where people would phone up and pick you up from the bottom of the gangway and whisk you off for dinner or in country to go horse riding and stuff. So uh, as a young 19 year old exposed to all those delights, uh, six months later, it felt like I was 32. It was quite some, quite some eye-opening experience for a young man to suddenly be taken to America for six months and treated. Um, after 18 months, I was sent to the Commando Forces Band in Plymouth, and uh, don't be fooled by the title, it does, doesn't refer to any specialist training, it just refers to the hierarchy that we were under at the time. And uh, that was a great band to be in because uh, we had a couple of foreign trips each year, Malta, Cyprus, back to the States, uh, some tours around the UK, and occasionally playing at places like uh, the Royal Albert Hall and Horse Guards Parade. Uh, a great bunch of boys to be with, and because um, it was all boys in those days, now the Royal Marine Band Service uh, takes women as well, rightly so. So it was a great band to be in, and uh, for three, four, five years, that's what we did. I just played music, rehearsed, uh, and played a bit of rock and jazz in, in our spare time, and it was, it was a great place to be. What was your favourite place to play in at that time? I mean, what's the most magnificent venue, magnificent, magnificent venue you've been to? What was the most eye-opening thing? I think for me, the highlight in my career was playing at the Royal Albert Hall because some of the numbers we played with the masked bands, um, they were rock numbers, big rock numbers. I had the Tiger and um, Love is All Around You. And I was the drummer. And, the, um, and if you've ever been to the Royal Albert Hall, it's a huge venue. And once the drums were set up, they all had to have microphones put on them. And the sound engineer says, oh, can I have a bit of bass drum? Can I hear the snare? And there's two other 200 musicians waiting for me to finish my, my sound check. And then he finished, he said, oh, can you play all the drums together? Of course, I didn't need telling twice. And I gave them all a, a 30 second drum solo, which, when in fact they only needed five seconds. And uh, the whole gig, the whole three or four day gig in, in London with uh, me on drums in centre stage. Um, I think that was the highlight of my career. So, yes, that would be it. I've got to tell you, I love that. And nobody saw me on the camera, but I was doing love hearts with my hands. I think that's so epic. You're supposed to do five seconds and you do a 30 second drum solo. You're epic. I love you. I think it's great. You exhibit good taste. Go for it, Chris. I've been, I've been talking the whole time. Sorry, I was just laughing maniacally off screen. I was still mute. Um, <clears throat> so, 1982, well, 1983, Falklands War starts. What were what were your feelings and what were the feelings of some of your comrades towards this? Because it was quite, quite a sudden event, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it came out of nowhere. It was actually 1982, uh, Chris. 1982, April the 1st, the Argentines decided to invade the Falkland Islands, falsely claiming it to be theirs. And uh, to be honest, nobody really knew where it was. Uh, we saw on the news that it had been invaded. We'd been sent on Easter leave. I had a, a whole two weeks worth of gigs lined up at a holiday camp. And to suddenly find that the, the Argentines had invaded some of our islands was something of a surprise and a shock. And a look at a map uh, revealed eventually that um, they were 8,000 miles away in the South Atlantic. Um, so there was a lot of sabre rattling going on by the Iowa government. And then suddenly everyone, including the Royal Marine Band, were recalled from leave back to their barracks. The Parachute Regiment, the Royal Marine Commandos, the fighting units. And for some reason, they decided they needed a band. And the reason was uh, in our, our civilian role, uh, sorry, our non-military role was, was as medics attached to the medical squadron. And they were packing up to go to war on the cruise ship Canberra, a giant white cruise ship. And they decided, they realized they would be 40 members short, stretcher bearers, uh, bottle washers, you know, um, ad hoc medics, if you like, instantly trained medics. And those people were the band. So we were summoned into the band room by the boss and we were expecting to guard the barracks whilst the roughly tufty commandos went off and sorted out the war. Uh, and then we were told uh, we had 48 hours to pack our bags and make our way down to Southampton. So it was quite a surprise and a surprise to hear where the Falklands were and surprised to find that we were going. That's really interesting that you were also medics. I mean, 
my lack of military experience here is, is going to shine really, really bright. But I would just think that medics are medics and you had separate jobs. So I find that very interesting that you were not just a band player, drummer, but also working in the medical field. Did you have a lot of training before you went out and, and had to become classed as a medic as well? No, we didn't because uh, it was in the time during the Cold War and the military doctrine, it said that the Russian hordes would come across the, the uh, German planes using biological and chemical and nuclear weapons. And actually our job was to decontaminate the bodies before they could be operated on. Anyone was wounded with the decontaminants of nuclear or, or, or not biological agents. And the magic uh, thing they gave us for this was something called Fuller's Earth, which is basically a non-smelling token powder. That's the only defense we had. So you'd be in your gas mask and suit and you'd be rubbing, banging or blotting people with uh, this token powder to absorb any agents and nuclear uh, fallout. And that's all we had, but that was our job on paper to decontaminate people before they actually could go in and be operated on. Otherwise they would just contaminate the, the operating theater. So that was quite a, a change to suddenly find ourselves going to war on a cruise ship with a medical squadron for a conventional war where we'd be used as uh, stretcher bearers or uh, ward assistants. Um, there wasn't actually a prescribed role, but we, as soon as we sailed from Portsmouth, uh, sorry, Southampton on the Canberra, which was a civilian uh, cruise ship, um, it was used as a troop ship. Uh, we, we got to work uh, being trained as medics, shown some very horrific uh, Vietnam uh, films about operating, being taught what debridement means, which is a, a French word that means scooping out the dead flesh from a wound and packing it out so it doesn't go septic. I know, other than dinner parties, I've never had much use for it, to be honest, but um, <laughs> it was useful to know, along with what a sucking wound to the chest does, which... Um, if you get a hole in the wall of your chest, your, your lungs don't work properly and how to repair them with a piece of plastic and sticky tape. So all these, uh, what we thought may be useful things were taught to us on the way going south. But in truth, none of us thought we'd be using them because there were uh, intense diplomatic efforts going on uh, organized by the Americans. And uh, Hague, his name was, uh, was going between Argentina and England trying to negotiate a deal which uh, in our case, uh, from Maggie Thatcher's point of view, was the Argentines had to leave the islands and the Argentines, Argentines were intransigent that they must have sovereignty over the islands. Uh, so eventually, um, but we thought that would um, lead to some success eventually, this was our hope. And we'd come back a few weeks later with a, a tan and a medal and a good story, a couple of weeks on a cruise ship. But sadly that wasn't to be and uh, not everybody sailing south with us was gonna come home afterwards. Like you said, it's a, it's a hell of a long way down there. I mean, I, I, I studied the first Battle of the Falklands in 1914 and Admiral Sturdy's journey down was a hell of a long time. How was your journey down to the South Atlantic? Well, the journey was quite good because, like I say, we'd, um, they'd commandeered a, a cruise ship. So we were on this p &O cruise ship, the Canberra, which was quite comfortable. And um, it was hastily had a couple of helicopter decks um, welded onto the over the swimming pools. Uh, but it was still quite comfortable and uh, we set sail and I think the idea was we all set sail in a hurry, the task force, hundreds of ships, with the idea of putting pressure onto the Argentines. Uh, and so once we'd sailed, there was no great hurry to get there because um, A, it was a long way away, but B, it was also putting on political pressure. Um, but after about a week, we put into Africa, a place called Freetown in Sierra Leone, uh, to refuel. It was a horrid place. It was just, uh, it, was a, it was a great petroleum depot. And um, it was in the equatorial sun, so it was quite hot. No one was allowed ashore. And these little bum boats were coming around trying to sell us trinkets and, and furs, and they could be hoisted up onto the deck in exchange for some plastic containers, which they would use to steal fuel from the depot. So at that point, um, some of the troops managed to, to barter a, a little monkey and bring it up on a basket and have it on the ship for about an hour before it was ordered off the ship by the senior officers. And uh, we think they were jealous because it was, it was wearing a little uniform uh, and uh, it had a colonel's rank. They put a colonel's rank on it, but they sent it ashore without, uh, without a pension, much, much to everyone's disgust. 
been so boring. How monkey would have been so you could oh my god, you could have had a Voitech on your on your ship. Sorry, just in case nobody knows what Voitech is, it's the bear that fought in the Second World War with the Polish uh uh Andalus's army, basically. You could have had your own monkey bear. Well, interesting thought. Um, I think the idea of getting rid of him was in case he had any disease and passed it through the fighting troops. So uh, not, not that the senior officers were worried he would be better at their jobs than them. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a risk when you bring a monkey on a ship. I've, I've said that before. And that's why sometimes you have to spank a monkey. Naughty monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I let Chris calm down. I'm fine. I'm fine. I just wasn't expecting. We have talked about the cool monkey that you didn't get to keep, <laughs> which is a shame. But talk us through the morale. Were you guys excited? Was there was the morale high? Were you? Did you know what you were going to expect at this stage? Well, at that point, we were still hoping for the best. But we had on board the Canberra. We had a, a couple of thousand Royal Marine commandos, young, roughly tufties who'd spent all their life training for a war, and we also had a, a regiment of the par the parachute regiment who equally um, are trained for war. And they, they have this intense rivalry between uh, their cat badges. And uh, so uh, they were doing training around the deck, running and uh, in the equatorial heat and doing press ups and weapon training off the back of the ship. But they were the tensions were building up and we were sailing slowly, uh, as I've said, to, uh, to um, pass the, uh, to put on pressure on the Argentine government. So eventually, though, um, tensions and cat badge rivalries got the best of them, and there was a bit of name calling, pigtail pulling, and handbag swinging. So that's when our boss, uh, John Ware, said, um, I think we'll get our instruments out. We, we weren't supposed to take our instruments. We'd taken them for our own sanity. So the boss uh, found us a space to rehearse, and we put on, um, first of all, a military band uh, concert for, for the troops. Um, most of the officers came, but not many of the young lads. They didn't think it would be their cup of tea, shall we say. So we also broke down into a jazz quartet that I played in and also a small rock band. And we went into the smaller bars and messes to entertain the troops and soothe the savage beasts, shall we say. And it helped because we were the only entertainment on board. So we were doing our own duties in the day and then in the evenings playing around the bars on the ship to entertain the troops and uh, keep them happy. And we were the only Marines allowed in the parachute regiment uh, mess because they called us crap hats because anyone with a red berry apparently is, is a crap hat. I'm sorry, so, what? Yeah, the, 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 the parachute regiment wear red berries and they call everyone else who doesn't have a red berry a crap hat. It's just, 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 a, just inter, inter service banter, it's just the way it is. Everyone has to believe they're the best. Uh, and unlike the Royal Marines who know they're the best, it's, just, it's a slight difference. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they were actually, um, um, they were actually, they were devoid of any entertainment. They, they didn't take their band with them. So we went into their mess one night to play for them. And um, they were grumbling and growling at these Marines in their, in their, in their, in their, in their mess, their, their bar. And luckily our, our keyboard player, Bruno Brown, had arranged a song called, the, or a tune called The Ride of the Valkyries, which is a, a heavy Wagner piece, but it's also the regimental march of the parachute regiment and we did it as a funky jazz number and they loved it and we couldn't do a thing wrong after that because we'd, uh, we'd started off with their own regimental march and they finished up standing on tables punching each other for fun so um <laughs> yeah that's that's, uh, that's the parachute regiment for you bless them but i have to say they were very professional soldiers so when the marines and the paras went ashore to do the dirty business of war they were they were very good at what they do so uh, all, all credit to them there so we then make our way as far as um, Ascension Island, which is an island in the middle of nowhere, right on the, uh, the equator. And we hover around there for about another week, whilst, again, we hope the diplomatic efforts are going to work. But if not, it gives the chance for all the ships and all the men to, re, um, to move all the stores that have been hastily put on the wrong ships around the fleet. But unfortunately, there was a, a submarine threat. And um, so Canberra being the main asset with troops, uh, we had to sail every night uh, to, um, to sail around the island in a zigzag pattern just to avoid any possible submarine threat. And uh, this worried the band because actually at that time we were accommodated below the waterline. So we were quite concerned because that's obviously where, that's where, tend to, that's where torpedoes tend to come through <laughs> below the waterline. 
Um, we only got a, a decent cabin um, up, up the top uh, during the air raids that were coming in later in May. So um, it was, uh, someone seemed to have it in for the band, wherever there was danger, we seemed to be accommodated. So we, we hung around the Ascension Line for two weeks and then eventually uh, we heard that uh, the Belgrano, the Argentine ship, the Belgrano had been sunk and we knew then we were going to be in a fighting war and the mood on the ship, on the ship changed. Obviously Belgrano going down, but then you also have um, HMS Sheffield going down as well. How, how were the feelings aboard with you know, being on a ship that could be a very easy target? Well, first of all, there was some elation, teenage, so we say teenage, but older than that, young men elation. They were the enemy and a major piece had been taken off the board, as it were, like a chess piece. But soon we realised once that had passed that actually they were just men like us being sent to a war by older men back in their own countries. And they were sailors and uh, we were sailors at that point and all equally vulnerable. I think our, our attention changed a bit, our, our attitude changed when a couple of days later uh, we heard that HMS Sheffield had been hit and uh, we'd lost about 20 uh, Royal Navy sailors. So having lost the ship and we knew then we'd lost men, we knew we weren't going to settle for a one-all draw and we knew then it was going to be a proper shooting war. So with mm -hmm. that, um, the whole of the task force sort of head, headed south with more purpose. Uh, Canberra, uh, the, the Hermes, the HMS Invincible, the aircraft carriers, all heading south, to, not only to put pressure on the, um, the Argentines, but to physically remove them. So D-Day, 21st, talk us through that. What happened? How did you feel? Overnight, on the, uh, we had a briefing on the, um, the 20th of May by Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly. He was our overall boss. Uh, he was a Royal Navy um, uh, a commander, a surgeon. And a great boss, great man, great leader. And uh, his book, The Red and Green Life Machine, is well worth a read. But he, um, he gave us our briefing and the band was split into teams. And at one point, the whole band were going to go ashore, then half the band, then some were going to Goose Green. It what really was the fog of war as the situation changed. But in the end, overnight on the 20th, 21st, it was decided that we were, um, the band were going to stay on board as the main unit left on board the Canberra whilst the hospital went ashore. So on the morning of the 21st of May 1982, it was a beautiful spring morning and I've got pictures in my book uh, of me stood on the deck grinning like a Cheshire cat uh, and uh, whilst we put all our troops ashore and by about mid-morning we'd have got most of the Royal Marines and the Parachute Regiment off the ship and we were busy unloading stores. Uh, when the Argentine Air Force uh, came in and started the many and varied air attacks uh, on all the shipping around us. We were very lucky not to get hit ourselves, uh, being a great big white cruise ship, uh, but ships next to us were, were being hit, bombs were being dropped, everyone with a gun. Uh, and on Canberra, we had 26 different uh, machine guns just tied to the rails. We were putting up a hell of a lot of lead at these enemy planes flying in, bombing the ships. There were missiles going off, bombs going off, rockets, uh, planes being blown out of, the, out of the sky. It was quite a, a, a cacophony of sound and also um, an, an incredible sight to see. Uh, and uh, our job or my job at that particular time was to meet helicopters uh, to bring, who were bringing in the wounded from uh, the battles. At that point, they were only uh, the Argentinians. There were no British wounded or dead at that time. So we were meeting the helicopters and bringing them in uh, and uh, unloading them and uh, taking the wounded down below. So yeah. it was uh, an incredible day, the 21st of May, always uh, et deeply etched on my mind. Very frightening in places, uh, yeah, very scary. And um, yeah, just an incredible day. How, how much of the conflict did the, the overall conflict did you see? Well, my war was mostly on the ship, uh, the Canberra, because of that, the, the ever changing, the quickly changing situation with Surgeon Commander Jolly. So he decided that we would stay on the ship uh, because once all the troops, the fighting troops, had gone ashore, actually Canberra would have been left with just its civilian crew, and we'd already taken on some walking wounded Argentinians who needed guarding because they were seen as a, a threat, a, a security threat. So the band were issued weapons and myself and colleagues had to guard these um, 
the special forces and uh, conscript Argentine soldiers to make sure that the, the ship itself was secure. So we switched from being medics to prisoner of war guides. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how we started doing that um, duty uh, was from day one when we got our first wounded on board. Also, unfortunately, on that day, we got our first dead on board. There were two Royal Marine helicopters that were shot down by the Argentines. Um, I suppose you could say that le legitimate targets, they were light, light helicopters. Uh, and one of them was uh, piloted by a friend of mine, uh, and he landed his helicopter in the water uh, successfully and was swimming ashore, but he was shot and killed in the water by the Argentines. Uh, and then from that moment on, when we, we actually unloaded their bodies from the helicopter, uh, to my mind, the, the Argentines became the enemy. I referred to them as the enemy. That, that was a sea change for me, uh, seeing and dealing with that. So that was, uh, that was a, a, a make a big difference to, to how I dealt with the prisoners and my, my attitude to, to the war then. So uh, that was very sad. It was a few days later, we had to conduct burials at sea uh, for these four Royal Marines who'd been killed. And um, that was very surreal. It was like, you, you don't, it's the sort of thing you see in a film or a documentary. You don't imagine as a young man, you're gonna be st stood on, uh, on a deck on a, on a gray day with a gray sea and the gray sky committing uh, your, your comrades' bodies to the deep. So that was a very surreal experience just a few days later. Um, so for me, the, the, the most conflict I saw uh, was on the 21st uh, with all the bombing and shooting and aircraft coming down around us. And uh, that was an absolutely horrendous day etched on my, permanently etched on my memory. So how, how did you find the time prisoners? Was there a difference between the Special Forces soldiers and the conscripts in the way they conducted themselves or the way they felt about the war? A little, you could tell they were a bit wide-eyed. They'd been told, uh, they'd been told by the government and the papers that the Canberra had been um, bombed and uh, was on fire. In fact, there were several uh, uh, newspaper uh, head headlines, which I've included in my book, that, um, that that described that. So they were surprised to be brought on board this giant white ship and find that it was not in any way damaged at all. Um, but they were all happy to be alive. They were told by the government that the British would kill them, the Gurkhas would eat them, and they would be executed. And but instantly they were um, well looked after by us. They had the equal amount of medical attention um, in the ward, in the room, the ward that, where the wounded were that I was guarding them. They could move around with permission. Um, and it goes back to this being a drummer in a, in a Royal Marine uniform. I applied uh, uh, musical intellect, shall we say, and uh, common sense even though I was carrying a gun uh, and treated them like, uh, like people, uh, which actually ended up uh, moving ahead a little bit, I'll cut up, but it actually ended up with me coming back from the war with the, the most unusual war souvenir, which was a signed thank you card from the enemy, which I now still have and uh, features in my book, which I'm sure you're gonna ask me about at some point. So I'll get the plug in. But, the, um, but yeah, I've got this wonderful card signed by about 20 Argentine prisoners that I looked after. And, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that perhaps near, near the end. The, um, the war goes on. Um, uh, our Royal Marines and Paras do what we pay them to do and that they're very good at it. And in short order, 74 days, uh, the war comes to an end and the Argentines surrender on the islands. But uh, in the Southern Hemisphere at this time, it's the beginning of their winter. So we have, um, we have now eight, 9,000 Argentine troops that we're now responsible for, and that there's very little um, uh, accommodation. They've made the place a hell of a mess in Port Stanley. Um, there's nowhere to keep them. So obviously you've got two giant ships, the Canberra, which is ideal, and the North Sea Ferry, the Norland, which was always down there, also down there. And, and we took uh, 5,000 and they took 4,000 of these Argentine troops uh, aboard. To, to take them home. But the government wouldn't allow them home. Their Argentinian government wouldn't allow them home because, um, well, it was, a, it, was a, it was a defeated army and they didn't want them back. They were a, a, a political junta uh, made up of a general, an air force and an admiral, and they were clinging to power. Hence the reason they invaded the Falklands in the first place. So they didn't really want them back. It was only when the Red Cross uh, under the Geneva Convention stepped in that they agreed they would accept their um, troops back, but only on civilian ships, 
which was the Canberra in the Norland. Again, another embarrassment for them to ships they claimed had been sunk and in flames were now heading into an Argentine port. So it took two or three days to sail across to um, Argentina and we docked in this little uh, industrial port called Puerto Madryn. And we started um, disgorging our, our prisoners. And uh, we were told not to go ashore, obviously, but because um, it, was, it wasn't, uh, the Canberra became neutral territory, I believe. We were even flying the Argentine flag under sort of um, uh, a special rules of the Red Cross. Uh, but I was carrying a stretcher and I ended up uh, stepping foot ashore in Argentina and carrying uh, an, uh, a wounded Argentine on a stretcher uh, to a waiting ambulance. And when I put him down in the ambulance, he, he stood and said, uh, he sat and said to me, thank you, and shook my hand. Of course, the other Argentines there ashore couldn't really understand it. But he was one of those that had signed my thank you card. Uh, so back on the ship, and then um, we've got rid of our sort of three or four thousand prisoners up gangway, and then we head back to the Falklands proper to pick up all the Royal Marines. And the reason for that was uh, there was a political will at home, and Margaret Thatcher wanted to capitalize on the fact that we'd won a war. And uh, so they wanted us back as quickly as possible to have the victory parades. So uh, Canberra picked up all these um, Marines uh, from around the islands. The band, we went into Port Stanley and played a Thanksgiving concert in the cathedral for one night only uh, before getting back on the Canberra. And uh, we all headed off north towards um, our victory parades and pat pats on the back. So talk us through this voyage home. How was it? What was the feeling on board? And then, well, you said there was a victory parade. So talk us through a little bit about that as well. Well, the journey home was, for the most part, one giant party. No one had any duties to do. There was no fitness to be had. Uh, there was some, the weather got warmer as we got back towards the equator. There was beer on board. The band were busy playing every night in different combinations for different people. Uh, the only sadness was we realized not everybody who went south with us was coming back. Um, we did lose two, 270 odd uh, people uh, in, in that war and um, some of them weren't coming back with us, which is which is obviously very sad. I could relate to it. I, I, my own father had died, as I mentioned right at the, at the beginning of the podcast, that um, my own father had been killed. So I, to, for me, I was able to resonate and empathize that um, for every father not coming back, there would be another mother, child, children, grandparents, who, whose lives now irrevocably have been changed. So um, tinged with sadness, but for the most part, we're relieved. We're, we've got away with it. We've, we've won this war against all the odds in quick time. And there's quite a big party to have all the way back. And the night before we get uh, into Southampton, we, we, there's a Royal Navy tradition of something called up channel night. Everybody's ship coming back to England has to go up the channel. On the left is the Cornish coast. Then you get to Plymouth, if you're going into Plymouth, then you get to Portsmouth or Southampton. So there's usually a, a big ceremony. And for us, it was a formal beat retreat. The band, the band of Her Majesty's Royal Marines, as it was, His Majesty now, of course, are famous for doing beat retreat ceremonies. And we did one on the deck uh, of Canberra for, for the three or 4,000 Marines we had with us. And they all sang along to rural Britannia, land of open glory. And it was quite a, an emotional evening. Uh, the next morning, we round uh, the Isle of Wight and we head into Southampton and Canberra is surrounded by hundreds of well-wishing boats and uh, helicopters and planes and the people uh, who come turned out to, to welcome us back. And it was because it, the journey back had been about 10 days, so it had taken a while for us to get back. So we'd sort of settled into this. But amongst the boats, there were some uh, there were some kindly uh, some kindly ladies who lifted their tops to show us that they weren't armed, which was very nice. And each time they did so, there was a cheer from all the Marines. Uh, but sadly, then uh, one of the mothers also joined in and lifted her top. And if you've ever been to a football match and you've seen the ball go over the net, where the cheer changes to a oh dear, uh, yes, that's what happened every time the girls uh, lifted their tops. There was a cheer. But unfortunately for the mother, there was a bit of a, oh, bit of a groan there. So I anyway, put a smile on everyone's face and, <laughs> and I could see your face now on the, on the camera. 
<laughs> Chris is the one who's laughing hysterically, and I have my mouth open, you gaping are, like a fish. Like, yes, you are. So, um, so that truly really yeah. what happened. And then we pulled into uh, Southampton, and there were about thirty-five thousand people on the dockside waiting to greet us. And the band played our last tune on the on the forward flight deck, and we handed over to the Royal Marine Band who, who were ashore, who hadn't quite gone with us. So that was quite something. And eventually, we got off the ship, uh, met with our families. And then we had to drive back to Plymouth in, in a convoy of coaches. A lot of Marines came from Plymouth. And, uh, but every couple of hundred yards, the coach would be stopped. Uh, the doors would be opened, beer would be passed in. Uh, there were people lining the streets, the, the motorways, the bridges. So it was a tumultuous welcome back uh, for us young, uh, young servicemen. But um, like I say, it was the Marines and the Paras who really did a lot of the dirty work. My, 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 my war was relatively clean, although with some excitement here and there. And then we get back to Plymouth, we have a few weeks leave, and then we're all summoned to London for a big victory parade uh, with Maggie Thatcher and the, the, the Queen and uh, all manner of dignitaries right through London. Uh, and then slowly but surely, we all dissolve back uh, to our normal duties as musicians, which which suited us because Commando Forces Band was a great band and we got back into doing tours around the world and playing around the country and drinking a lot of beer and meeting a lot of uh, people, which it was a great band to be in. Until eventually uh, my time came to leave and in 1987, the Royal Marines moved me from Plymouth to Deal in Kent where I now live as the percussion instructor at the Royal Marines School of Music. And that was a great little gig uh, as well. Uh, I didn't have to travel uh, so much. Like I, I got used to that. Uh, plenty of private gigs. But unfortunately, in 1989, we were visited by the IRA who planted a, a bomb in the band room. Uh, just missed me by about five minutes. Uh, unfortunately, killed 11 of my colleagues, Royal Marine musicians. So that was a very sad day uh, in, in my life. And another one of those etched deeply into my memory, one I'll never forget. Uh, the sights and sounds of that day. Uh, and so I move on to 1991, where, where um, I've got two young children. I'm about uh, coming up to my 30s. And my career well, is stagnating in the Royal Marines from a, from a progression point of view. I've made it to sergeant. Uh, I'm never going to make it any further than that. I'm a, I'm a percussionist. I'm a drummer. Uh, I'm not one of these clever um, 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 piano players or uh, conductors. So I decided to leave the Royal Marines and join Kent Police, which is where uh, I had myself another uh, 12 years career. But again, I was just a drummer in a police uniform, really. I applied the law and my own drumming way with my musical intellect and sense of humour. And so I, that's how I dealt with, with life. And uh, until eventually each year, the, the band, we have a reunion, the guys who went to the Falklands. And about two years ago, uh, during lockdown, we, uh, just before lockdown, actually, we had a, a, a reunion in Plymouth and uh, we realised that actually seven of the guys that had gone to the Falklands with us have now passed away um, through lifestyle and age, unfortunately. And over a glass of, uh, of beer, I said, someone should write our story down before it's too late. And they said, you should do it. They all pointed at me. I write pantomimes up here in Deal in Kent for the Royal Marines. And they said, you should do it, Brian. So I sat down and I gathered my diaries and my photographs of the time, and I've written an award-winning, best-selling book called The Band That Went to War. And I'm very proud of it, and um, people have read it, um, have said it's, uh, it's a damn good read. There's a bit of my humour in it somehow. And it tells the story, uh, it's not a war story, but it tells the story of musicians in a war, as I've sort of outlined to you in this podcast. So I, I am rather pleased with that. And it's doing quite well, and I commend it to anyone that wants a good read on a holiday or on a plane. We, we usually leave this for the wrap, so I'm going to just throw it out now. So it's out now. Um, whereabouts can people get it from? Well, the book you can get it from Amazon. You can get it, and that's the the website, not the river. The um, you can get it off Pen and Sword. Um, if you just Google it, the band that went to war, um, it'll pop up uh, on, on Google, uh, no, no problem. Amazon uh, currently have it on sale. And uh, yeah, that's all I can say about it, really. It's got me a few. I've managed to get myself on the BBC sofa. And I've managed to get myself a national radio a bit because there is an addendum to this. Uh, and the, the thank you card I told you about uh, during, during the podcast, uh, signed by the enemy. 
about three years ago, an Argentine historian had found uh, this online. Uh, there was an online spat where I used it as evidence to show that actually we did treat them well. I've got a, a signed thank you card. And what he did was he, um, he's found about 15 of the signatories to the card and put them back in touch via email. And next year in 2024, there will be a, a reunion. So I think oh, that's wow. quite a positive outcome to come from a, a war when you compare it to what's happening in the uh, Ukraine at the minute uh, um, and the bitterness and, and nastiness that's happening there. Um, whereas actually out of my war, something good and positive has come out of it. That's incredible. And I think that's, do you know what? Let us know when that happens. We, we would love to know afterwards how, how you felt because that would uh, be a great addition to this. Don't you think, Chris? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, it's going to happen, I think, in 2024. It was going to be a solo trip, but um, it looks like there'll be a small delegation. Uh, so um, there is a, a, a an army, retired army colonel, British colonel, who post hostilities went to great lengths to gather all the remains up of Argentines who had been badly uh, killed on the, on the battlefield and had no ID. And he put everything he could belonging to them together. And over the years, they've been able to identify them and tell the parents in Argentina, oh, the, this is your son, this is what happened to your son, this is where he's buried. And so um, he's organizing this delegation next year, um, Colonel Jeffrey Cordoza. So I should be going back with him next year for um, a reunion with the people who have signed my thank you card. Yeah, that'd be amazing. So as we said, your book, Band That Went To War, is out. I'm gonna try and get it, we'll I'll badger Alina and Alex to put it on the uh, History Hack bookshop. That way, for every sale, the podcast gets a small amount of money and you get more money than if it goes through uh, Jeff Bezos's river-based uh, bookstore, which is always good. Yeah, well, I'm not intending to retire on the on the income from the book. It's, <laughs> you don't get rich as an author these days unless you're J.K. Rowling. But thank yeah. you very much. That'd be great. I got my royalty check through the other day and it was zero. <laughs> so I know that feeling. <laughs> Brian, it's been great to have you on. Thank you so much for giving up your time to speak to us. It's been great. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.